Well, I'm sure that applause was partially for the announcement, um, which was inspired. Um, and it gives me the opportunity to focus on welcoming you all um, and uh, to say it's a particular pleasure uh, to greet Jenny Uglo, and, um, et, who's very familiar to Charleston audiences, and to introduce Ian Wilson to Charleston, to the Charleston Festival for the first time. They both hold prominent positions in the world of letters and are prolific and award-winning authors. This event revolves around two books, Jenny Uglow's The Pine Cone and Ian Wilson's The Potter's Hand. They're united by the theme of visionary creators and makers who came from radical families and had a zest for progress, but also by the fact that both books were destined to be written by these particular authors. Jenny Uglo comes from Cumbria, the county with a remarkable heiress, Sarah Losh, designed and oversaw the building of one of the most unique churches in the UK, St Mary's in Rear. The Pinecone is her story and that of the enlightened world in which she grew up and mingled. Ian Wilson was brought up in Staffordshire, where his father was managing director of Josiah Wedgwood and Sons. His novel, The Potter's Hand, pays homage to Wedgwood, the great craftsman, innovator and industrialist whose factories did so much to transform the 18th century and who spawned a remarkable dynasty which included Charles Darwin. The novel also encompasses the turbulent history of the period. Not surprisingly, the Losches and the Wedgwoods intersect. And I, but I'll leave it to Jenny and Ian Wilson to tell you more about that. But just before I do, I'd most appropriate, like, appropriately, I think, like to thank Farrow and Ball for supplying all the paint that we've had to use as sort of extra paintwork on the stage and throughout the festival. Okay. <laughs> So the format will be, I'm going to hand over to uh, Ian Wilson. He'll talk for a while. He'll pass um, the baton on to Jenny. Um, they'll have a little conversation and then take some questions from the audience. Ian Wilson. Well, thank you very much indeed. I hope these microphones work. Can you hear? Yes. Oh, good. Oh, I'm not sure whether it's good or not. You'll have to decide that yourselves. Um, as has been said, I came from the potteries, and I, I suppose I always knew once I'd become a writer that one day I would want to write about Josiah Wedgwood. I, in a way, felt that I grew up with him myself. I mean, I certainly grew up with the fifth Josiah, who was my father's best friend, and it was uh, with the fifth Josiah that my father, Norman Wilson, and a, a, a clever group of young Wedgwoods engineered the move from the old Josiah's factory in Etruria, in Stoke-on-Trent, um, out into the country, partly because they were lefties and they thought that the life of the potters had become intolerable in Stoke. I don't know if you've seen photographs of pre-Second World War Stoke-on-Trent, but it was pretty awful. The mortality rate was on average 40 for uh, a worker in the potteries. They all died of silicosis, and um, they wanted to go and build in the country, as, of course, the first Josiah had done. And uh, I was talking not long ago to a woman in uh, Stone, where I grew up, who'd worked as a secretary in the Barliston factory, which they'd built. She was the secretary of a wonderful potter called Victor Skellen. And she said she could remember either my father or the fifth Josiah, always saying when the new bit of work was held up, um, would it pass the test? And the test always was, would the first Josiah have admired or liked it? And his presence was constantly there. Indeed, my father read his letters uh, aloud to me in the way other children have um, Enid Blyton or Little Red Riding Hood read them, so that he seemed to me a very vivid figure with his common sense, his honesty, his decency, and this vast range of interests. He was, as you probably know, uh, somebody who had more or less no education. The Wedgwoods were 
potters of old. They went right back to the 17th century as potters. And some of them were quite good potters, but none of them were potters in his league. And uh, smallpox swept through Burslem, the little village where they lived, when he was nine years old, killing nearly all his siblings. Five out of eight died in that epidemic. His parents died when he was very young, and he himself contracted smallpox and always had trouble with his leg, which eventually led to the, the leg being amputated when he was in grown-up life. I'm sure that was one of the things which drove him on, because he always had this sense of mortality and the thought that he might be uh, cut off before he'd finished his work. He was sent to school for about 18 months. I don't think they taught science in the little school in Newcastle under Lyme where he went. He taught himself chemistry. My father always used to say that to be a good potter, you have to be half chemist and half artist. And the first Josiah certainly was both. Um, he was also a geologist. It's a very good part of the country, particularly going up into Derbyshire, of course, with the Derbyshire Blue John and so forth, to study geology. It was years before Lyle had actually uh, written his definitive works on geology, but Wedgwood and Powell's, about whom Jenny knows more than I do in the Lunar Society, um, were beginning to get there and realize the age of the planet and the variety of minerals and so forth. For Wedgwood, he was always interested in everything. He was interested uh, in rocks for their own sake, but he was also interested in turning the minerals that he had dug up into beautiful objects. And as he set out on his own and became the famous potter that he was uh, going to become, he wanted better and better materials. I was one day in New York at a marvelous museum, which some of you probably know. It used to be at the very top end of New York, near Columbia University. It's now, nobody told me, and I had an old-fashioned guidebook, right down the bottom end um, in Wall Street. So I spent a busy day on the subway, zooming up and down. We eventually found it. Um, it's, the, it's the Museum of the American People, I think it's called. It's gone through all sorts of politically correct transformations. It used to be the Museum of Red Indians when I first went to it. And then it became Native Americans, and I think it's now the American People's. And there was an extraordinary photograph in one of the glass cases. I found myself looking at this pottery, which was made by Cherokee people. And um, it was impossible to believe that this hadn't been thrown on the wheel. The Cherokee were brilliant uh, potters, but they didn't have the wheel, and they, they built up by, by hand. But it was so fine, and there was a photograph of a young woman, it was a very early photograph, 1840s or 50s, and I thought, by golly, that young woman, who was very beautiful, uh, has just made Wedgwood's Portland vase. She was holding something which was exactly the same shape as Wedgwood's Portland vase. And, and then you looked at it closely, and it wasn't, it, it, but it was like a kind of uh, biblical water pot. If you read the Bible as a child and had little watercolor illustrations, it would usually be some woman with a pot on her head, making her way to Jacob's well or something of that kind. And uh, that's what she looked like. And as I went away from the museum, I remembered uh, my father, who was a very good-humored and jolly person and loved America, and always came back whistling Rogers and Hammerstein tunes and things after his um, visits there, uh, had driven down through the States with uh, a cousin called Hensley Wedgwood, who was the American uh, rep, I suppose we would say, I in the United States, based in New York. And they were standing beside what looks like a milestone. But when you actually look at the stone, it says, on this inner place near this spot, Josiah Wedgwood bought white china clay from the Cherokee Nation. Um, I went for you, because we've only been given a um, short time, uh, why he was buying clay from the Cherokee, but basically he'd had this awful quarrel with uh, the Cornish China clay, and he couldn't get white enough clay to make his famous jasper, which was one of the first great breakthroughs. Breakthrough, breakthroughs. And um, so he bought it. He heard that the Cherokee had the whitest Cherokee clay outside China, which was true. So he decided to go and buy it. He sent a representative. 
And uh, there is my father and Hensley standing by this jolly stone. And I suppose that was part partly what was sinking into my head as I went away thinking, I wonder if the day has now dawned when I should write my biography of Josiah. But as I contemplated writing non-fiction about the great Josiah the First, I realized there were all sorts of things that I wanted to know, which actually none of us do know. I wanted to know, for example, what it was like to be his extraordinarily clever, very melancholic wife, whose melancholic features had been so well captured by George Stubbs. George Stubbs, who was commissioned by Wedgwood to see if he could make um, ceramic palettes for the painter, and also if he could make ceramic plates larger than this lectern, um, about that thick, on which the painter could paint. He was getting fed up w with the slight graininess that you got, even if you painted on smooth board. And he wanted to paint on something that was absolutely smooth, yet the glossiness, either of a horse or a lion tearing the guts out of a horse and all the very morbid things that he liked painting. And um, he eventually, Wedwood had to go through endless trouble making these wretched plates, because they kept cracking, and the, you needed to get the temp temperature of the oven just, just right. And uh, by the end of it, when he'd given about a dozen of these plates to Stubbs, he thought Stubbs owed him something. And he commissioned Stubbs to paint the portrait, which is now to be seen in the Wedgwood Museum in Barlaston. Oh, the Wedgwood Museum, but don't get me started on that subject, unless you <laughs> want to with the questions and answer. And uh, so he told Stubbs what he wanted. He wanted two portraits, rather shocking for the great Unitarian who believed in the equality of the sexes, I must say. He wanted one of his daughters doing needlework. Um, one of the daughters was infinitely the cleverest of his uh, children, incidentally, Suki, who was another person who was brewing in my head and I wanted more about. Um, she was destined to become the mother of Darwin, Charles Darwin. Um, and then the other was the boys doing a chemical experiment and peering with excitement as, um, as the chemical experiment came to light. Well, of course, as I make um, Wedgwood's clever wife say in the book, this isn't a subject for George Stubbs. It's a subject for Wright of Derby. And um, clearly, uh, Mrs. Wedgwood would have much preferred for them to be painted by Right of Derby, and she says, if you get that man Stubbs here, all he'll do is paint her not very distinguished stable full of horses, which is, of course, what he did. And he painted the horses beautifully and makes the Wedgwood, look, Wedgwood family look like dolls who are stuck on horses. <laughs> and he stayed and stayed and stayed. And I, again, I've often thought, well, why did he stay for three months in Staffordshire when he was a sort of dashing about kind of person? Anyway, all these questions are not going to be answered by a biographer. And I thought to myself, therefore, by golly, I'm writing a novel. I didn't realize inside my head I'm actually writing a novel about this lot. And uh, so it came to be. And the, uh, the red Indian lady, as I still think of her in my politically incorrect way, the Cherokee lady, uh, holding her vase, was obviously key, central to the story. And I won't, uh, I won't tell you what happens, but she, she comes to Staffordshire. And I th I've got two minutes more, have I? Um, <laughs> I'll just read you a scene. Uh, it's a scene when poor old Josiah, partly because his doctor was Dr. Erasmus Darwin, a brilliant poet, uh, a great thinker, but by golly, I'm glad he wasn't my doctor. Um, <laughs> the only thing he could think of saying if you were in total agony was, try a little bit more opium, my dear. <laughs> and um, one of the Wedgwood boys, who of course became a drug addict, they're all drug addicts by the end of this book, um, <laughs> Tom, Tom Wedgwood, who sort of invented photography and would have got there if he hadn't been a drug addict, uh, said, oh, Dr. Darwin, I've got this friend. He's just come down from Cambridge. He's awfully depressed. We're doing what we can for him. We're giving him an allowance of £200 a year so he can carry on with his philosophical researches. But what do you recommend? Uh, um, Darwin said, more opium. What's his name? Oh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Um, <laughs> So it really was a rather disastrous um, thing. Wedgwood had opium by the spoonful and washed it down with brandy. And by the time he was trying to make his copy of the great Barberini vase, known as the Portland vase, I've invented the thought 
that later speaker at the Charleston Festival, um, his hand was starting to shake. <laughs> and so in this tiny scene, my Cherokee friend has actually come very unhappily married to England. Um, her skills have been recognized, but she hasn't yet met the great man, but she's actually being employed in his works. And if I've put this, might have done, yeah. Um, Wedgwood by now had a wooden leg. Uh, he was a sort of god in the works in Etruria, and he's making his regular tour of inspection, inspection of the works. Um, and he's worried because he, he has this habit of making lists inside his head and he keeps forgetting things, partly because of the brandy and opium. Such mental lapses never happened in the past. And there was something worse, something which caused the acutest pain of all. He couldn't quite bring himself to admit it as he clutched harder at his stick. His hands had begun to shake. Reason, his god, told him that more brandy and more laudanum would only make the shaking worse. But the painful consciousness that his hand now shook made him reach for both bottles with ever greater frequency. Besides, he wasn't deceiving himself. For an hour or two after taking two or three drops of laudanum in a glass of brandy and water, he could still make the best pots in Europe. Thereafter, the shaking began. He cringed to think of the botched Portland vases which he'd hurled in anger to the throwing room floor. Eh, lad! He put out his walking stick and prodded at a piece of wet clay which Isaiah Pale thought was fashioning into a plate. Even as the stick went out, Joss was aware that he was being unfair. He was a good modeler, was Isaiah, and that plate could easily have been rescued. It was the pain which made Joss stoop the clay on the end of his stick and hurl it to the floor. Not just the physical pain in his head, but the mental pain of remembering his own botches. He who, since the days of his apprenticeship, had never made a botch. That's not a Wedgwood plate. Not the way these messing with it. Yes, Mr. Joss. The patient fury with which the modeler endured his humiliation in front of the other workers stuck into Josiah's conscience. But you couldn't apologize to them. That would give them ideas. The works was pursuing its own life. He thought of what it would be without him, and he could imagine it all being perfectly satisfactory, like a well-made machine outliving its owner. But even as he was having this thought, he spun round on his wooden leg and bellowed, Who said that? There was silence in the modelling room. Somebody said a word. He could feel the blood heating in his throbbing skull. His lower lip was trembling with the agony of the whole situation. He really did not want this situation to develop. If he found the culprit, he would have to dismiss him on the spot, and he didn't want to do that. On the other hand, he couldn't be seen to climb down in front of the rogues, and that sort of language, language of sailors, was not to be tolerated at Wedgwood's. There was no danger of a confession. No one was going to lose their work and their day wage just for uttering a monosyllable. But it was conceivable that some of the more slavish young apprentices, resentful of their seniors, might betray them. And worse, there was the danger of ribaldry, inquiries by the younger hands as to the word's meaning. He must hobble on before the situation got out of control. There'll be no foul language in Etruria, he bellowed. When he left the modelling room, he could hear the rumble of laughter and badinage being exchanged. Was that really what they thought of him now? He was in the decorative modelling room now. He tried this time, simply as a mental exercise, to repeat the list of necessary tasks for the day. All seemed to be going well. Funny thing was, in spite of the slump caused by this wretched French war, there wasn't much diminution in trade for the decorative side of the business. It was in the useful wear that the slump had occurred, as if people were making do with chips tea sets and dinner plates until the hostilities were over. The quality, or the aspirant quality, seemed to have their appetite for luxurious items still. Perhaps the toppling of thrones and titles on the other side of the English Channel had actually increased the desire of the nouveau riche in England to mark out their territory with stupendous vases imitative of the antique examples in Sir William Hamilton's collection. Ee, yai, yai! Josiah Wedgwood stopped short. 
In the ordinary modeling room, his exclamations and his pauses have been governed by the purpose of finding fault. But it could actually, this, sorry, they now fell upon the most superb vase. It could actually have been an Etruscan antiquity. Or better than that, it would have been thrown by the hand of Josiah himself in the days of his perfection and glory. Indeed, he paused be beside it and looked, asking himself if, in this phase of opium-induced forgetfulness, he had in fact thrown the vase himself and forgotten doing so, but it was still wet. It had been thrown that morning. Wilbraham, he spoke to the foreman. I, Mr. Joss, who threw that vase? Thank you. Well, um, I'm a great admirer of Wedgwood, and I absolutely loved that um, novel, as Andrew knows. And, uh, and hearing you say that um, his presence was always there, even when you were growing up, and to your father and to the family, um, that's very much... Uh, oh, you're going to set me straight. OK. Um, but, but the sense of a presence always being there, a personal presence in, in work centuries afterwards, is very much what drew me to write um, my book, which is an odd book, about um, Sarah Losh, who built this church in, in Cumbria. Um, and I suppose also it, it does go back to uh, childhood in a different way, in that I grew up on the west coast of Cumbria, which is um, very bleak, and we once um, took our children there on a rainy day and they looked and they said oh god mum no wonder you read so many books <laughs> <laughs> so um, going from there to the Eden Valley the other side of the uh, Lake District um, was like going to a different country it was green it was lush it was beautiful and in this uh, valley, um, I was, was small, there was this very strange church, which at the time I think was just a, a spooky, mysterious sort of storybook kind of church. But things live in your mind. Um, and then years later, we went back again. Uh, actually, on a, it does even rain in the Eden Valley too, on a rainy day. And crossing the road, because I knew that church was there, you thought... That's strange. It's a little Byzantine uh, church. Um, what's it doing here? And then, in fact, it's built in 1842, which is when the great vogue for building Gothic churches started. So somebody obviously wanted to do something not only different, but kind of quite defiant. But you think, well, well, it looks like a Norman church, of which there are many in Cumbria. And you get a bit nearer, and you think, Norman church, carving around the door, dog tooth carving, I know about Norman churches. And then you go to the door, and the carving is not of dog tooth carving, but of flowers and corn and uh, a lo the lotus flower, extraordinary, and pine cones. And looking up... There are three windows over an absolutely sort of pyramidal, classical-shaped church. Three windows. And what are the carvings around the windows? One uh, is clearly of the sea. There are strange there are sort of starfish and fossils and curling seaweed um, and pine cones stepping them. The next uh, must be earth, because there are poppies and the lotus and, again, sheafs of wheat. And the third is the sky, carved with uh, the same wonderful plants and strange primitive forms, but also uh, birds, not very well carved birds, rather sort of stubby birds. Um, so they look like the work of uh, an amateur, of a local person. And once you've sort of had that experience of, of seeing the church, the curiosity, my curiosity was just uh, immense. And you go inside and the delights and strangeness <laughs> continues. So that the overwhelming feeling as you walk around the church and then around a sort of landscape which surrounds it, which has a copy of the Bewcastle cross, a copy of a Celtic cross rising to the sky, again with the carving, not quite what you would expect. Um, a graveyard, a family grave enclosure, and the graves are not neat 
uh, sort of gravestones with proper inscriptions. The graves are carved with extraordinary primitive forms, um, shells, but also primitive plants, like fossil plants. And beyond it is uh, a mausoleum, which is just like a, 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 a block, like an Etruscan tomb. And the hill rises, and beyond that, and on the top of the hill, is a very beautiful small chapel looking like a barn. So what is most uh, strong about the feeling of this place is that it must have been the work of one person. You know, This is not a committee, this is not a regular, this is not something that has evolved over time. This is something that was planned by one person. Um, so I wanted to find out who this person was. Um, and then even more extraordinary, uh, in terms of church building, um, we discovered that she was a woman and called Sarah Losh. Now, there are no uh, women architects. There were some women who sponsored church building in their parishes, and there were grand women in the past, uh, like Bess of Hardwick or someone who had built great buildings. But to actually design and, as she did, superintend every step of the building of this thing was quite extraordinary again. So um, I just really knew, it's like you saying you knew that at some point you had to write the novel. Um, you knew that I had to write this book, really, to satisfy myself and to see if I could tell a story. Um, and, uh, and also to try and see if I could work out or understand where her ideas came from because this is so strange this is 1842 it's just the very early years of the victorian age um and and so eventually i did and and as you feel josiah's presence with his stick so i began to feel the presence of uh, sarah losh um beautiful rich strange extraordinarily well educated but self-taught as a as a woman um working out her own ideas about not exactly faith but about time and about belief and about our place in the world and above all about it being a local world and a natural world it's great cycles of nature and a world in which as for the wedgwood pots um the past was always uh, with us. The past was very present. Just as Josiah looked at Hamilton's collection of Etruscan pots, so Sarah Losh looked back in time, both at the way that the church itself had developed um, and also the things that she felt gave turning life to this world, um, natural as well as made. And, and, uh, and I think just also being in that part of the world you feel that some of those ideas come simply from growing up there. Um, her family came from near a place called Holm Kultrum uh, on the Solway Firth, another strange landscape of mists and distances and marshes and plains. And there's a, a, a wonderful um, Norman Abbey there, uh, now it, uh, semi-ruined but being restored which has a great door and it stands up in these marshes like a huge sort of ship you know with the eagle and the bell tower on the top um, and then there are as soon as you think of that you think of the Norman uh, um, Isles of what's left of Carlisle Cathedral of abbeys like Lanacost of places even small places there's somewhere called Bridekirk near Cockermouth which has a font uh, which is carved with a mixture of Celtic and Viking designs and has a little, even a little picture of the mason who carved it saying, you know, I carved this. So you have sort of Norman, before the Norman you have the Viking, you have the Celtic, full of legends and also legends of strong women like St. Bega who came over from Ireland and built the abbey in St. Bees, which is where I grew up. Um, so there's all of that. Well, I think when she wanted to build her church, she wanted to build something that felt right, that it felt it was in the right place. And she loved these Celtic saints coming north, like St. Ninian, who was supposed to stop in this little village of Rhea, which is about five miles south of Carlisle, uh, on his way to Scotland to found the first church. So there are all those sorts of ideas. And then I think, but how did she... 
uh, uh, fit this in with um, the village and the world. Well, uh, her father was a, a squire, quite um, rich, and a family of four brothers. And the eldest John uh, had the land, so really they, they owned the land all around the village. And it was an odd village in that it was run by a group, he wouldn't call them a committee, called the Twelve Men, the Twelve Men of Rear, who met in the pub. They still meet in the pub and dispersed all the local charities and things like that. Um, when uh, Sarah eventually inherited, she couldn't be head of the Twelve Men as her father was, but she could certainly manipulate them to go the way that she wanted um and then well where does the money come from and the money came from a uh, venture of these brothers which was to start an alkali factory uh, on the banks of the Tyne they belonged to that same experimental generation of people experimenting with chemistry in their gardens and, uh, and then when the Napoleonic Wars came just as Josiah is worried about his useful wear going into a slump so there is a shortage of alkali for bleaching so these brothers think many connections with Newcastle I know and they start a factory the start of the British chemical industry so it's it's thought um, and that's where Sarah got her money from. And she was quite, as it were, hands-on about it. She was proud. When the census, in a later census, and you have to declare your occupation, she didn't put landowner or, you know, lady, I don't know where you would put lady of leisure, but, but she put soda maker. So she's a woman of the modern world, but she wants to use her money to make something for her village going into the past. And there was a church there. Um, uh, which um, she claimed was in, you know, a terrible state of dilapidation. And Rosemary Hill, who's also very interested in Sarah Losh, said uh, to me once that, um, oh, these antiquarians, you know, as soon as they say a church is in a bad way, watch out as <laughs> they're going to knock it down, because this is very much what happened. Many, many churches were destroyed, but this one was really falling down. Um, and I think Sarah had wanted to build it for a long time. She grew up um, with us, her sister. Her parents died. Mother died young. Uh, her father died when uh, they were young women. Uh, she and her sister, uh, Catherine, inherited. Um, and immediately they went abroad. They went to uh, Europe just after the Napoleonic Wars. Um, they went to Pompeii. They saw these Italian churches. Uh, in Pompeii, too, there's a strong feeling in her diaries, which she talks about, about cultures of the past, about people of the past who sort of lie under your feet and how this world can be found and can be brought to life again, just as uh, the discoveries of Pompeii were. They came back, they started to build, they improved their house, they built a school in a strange way, and then Catherine died. Um, and they've been completely inseparable. It's very like Jane Austen and, and Cassandra, really. Cassandra saying, the light has gone out of my life when um, Jane died. And, and, all, and at that point, really, Sarah really began to build. So everything she builds is a kind of memory, a kind of bringing to life not only the past, the Celtic past, the Norman past, but their lives together. Um, and... It goes beyond that because it is to do with time and it is to do with the past. So that when you actually look at the decoration and particularly look at these fossils, um, she did a lot of the work themselves. Inside the window, there are the, inside the church, there is a set of windows um, which are, I think, are, well, they are unlike anything uh, in other, another British church, which is thin sheets of alabaster, easy to carve, which again goes back to very, very early church uh, windows to Ravenna, where the windows are alabaster, they let in the light. But these are cut like stencils, and the stencils are of fossil ferns and uh, uh, fossil plants, so that the light shines into the church uh, through this ancient part, which is beneath our feet. Um, and yet that's very, very modern, it's, it's looking back. But it was absolutely the age of geological uh, discoveries and it the age, too, of the discoveries of the dinosaurs. And, and these fossils were found in the very mines over in Newcastle, uh, which were giving uh, some of her money because they're also connected with mines. So that the most modern industry is coming absolutely slap up against the most ancient layers of time. <coughs> Um, also the time of the discovery of what was called the great dinosaurs. Um, 
And um, there are wonderful illustrations in books of the ancient world with these marvellous creatures. And when you cross the road, as, as, as we did, and that rained in, you, you see the door, the windows, the shape of the church, all very strange. And then you look up and you think, oh, gargoyles. Uh, and then you think, they are very strange gargoyles. <laughs> uh, and one of them, for example, is a sort of dragon-like creature. Um, and again, ancient mythic folklore uh, dinosaur like but also very modern in that these actually aren't gargoyles they're ventilation uh, covering ventilation things and the dragon was over where she had her boiler see absolutely up to date must have a heated church so that when the villagers of Rhea came to church on a Sunday on a frosty morning as well as the bell ringing they would also see puffs of smoke issuing from the mouth of a dragon. <laughs> so there's a lovely touch. Um, and then another one is a turtle just coming out like this <clears throat> into the midair. And that, I think, comes... From, she was reading everything. Um, and she, she liked the, the stories of other people looking back, as it were, in time. Um, and one of the great uh, dinosaur hunters, he was an expert on tracks... Um, was asked to look at some tracks from sandstone uh, in Kakubri, just across the, the Solway Firth. Um, and when he did, he thought, I recognise those tracks, I think. Um, went back and got his wife, who was equally interested, actually, but she was also his wife, so she had to do domestic things. Anyway, he got married to make pastry, and they covered the whole of the kitchen table with pastry, a lot of pastry, <laughs> and then went out in the garden, got their pet tortoise, and put the tortoise on the pastry, and the tracks it made were exactly the same as the ones in the clip. So he thought, ah, what we were looking at is a fossil turtle, fossil tortoise. And there at rear, you have ancient and modern, this wonderful tortoise, local, leaping out into the air. So there are many other aspects to the church but all of them have this sense of a woman who is extremely interested in the past who is very literate who has a sense of humor who worked with wonderful local craftsmen encouraged them um, uh, and local materials Every, everything uh, that is in the church came from places that you can identify now all of which also have their stories um, and uh, it, it, is, it is a place, that, a church that just simply belongs in this little village, which is in a sheltered dip um, of the side of the hillside on the edge of the Petrol Valley, which goes into the Eden. But is now, because it's one of these magic places, so you must go there if you haven't been there, um, it's, it's like a, a, a little hole in time, because it is a tiny sheltered village still, but now on one side the train goes up to Carlisle, and on the other the M6 goes around it. So it's a sort of hidden island in the middle of the M6 uh, where you have the work of this um, uh, strange and, and um, uh, visionary uh, woman. Um, do you think I've got... To, shall I read? <laughs> I read a bit. This is I'm not used to reading. but um, So rather than tell, as it were, the rest of her story, uh, uh, like Andrew, I will read a little bit which... Um, probably gives you the feeling of uh, the kind of mix that we have there um, that makes this place so special. Um, anyway, I was saying that she doesn't simply copy the Romanesque. Everything she copied, she made slightly different herself. Um, like a geologist demonstrating the strata of belief she decorated the church with symbols that looked back to the earlier religions, myths and cults that lay buried beneath Christian imagery and ritual. As the wheat of Demeter and the grapes of Dionysus lay behind the bread and wine of the sacrament. On her carvings, pillars and altar, this is extraordinary, she placed the lotus, one of the early symbols of creation. The mists of the Nile told that before the universe existed, there was only an infinite ocean, the primeval being, none. Out of none, a lotus flower arose on a patch of dry land, and as the blossoms opened, a child stepped out, the self-created sun god, Atun, or Ra. 
The lotus was the womb of earth and light, its petals closing at sunset and opening at dawn. To the Romantics and to Sarah, it was a symbol of light, its petals representing the rays of the sun, and also of receptivity, reproduction, and continuing life. Hindu mythology was one source for the Romantic quarrying of myth. Now, one thing I haven't said is that her family, particularly her extraordinary uncle James, who was a Unitarian and a lawyer from Newcastle, were close friends of uh, Wordsworth um, and uh, New Coleridge, but they were, they were, the boys were at school with the Wordsworth brothers. Um, Sarah would have read the lyrical ballads, read them, had them read to her when they were in manuscript um, before uh, these poets became great. So that too is part of her imaginative uh, makeup. Um, but the, the, we cannot know uh, exactly how much Sarah read because we don't have notes of her reading. Uh, but her chapel is full of symbols, from the cockerel, snake and tortoise, often seen at the feet of classical gods and acting as the support of the deity, as in Hindu stories of the world being created on a turtle's back, to the lotus and the pomegranate, the Old Testament image of abundance and Persephone's fruit of summer and winter, day and night. The lotus, pomegranate and barleycorn were emblems of the passive generative power. Their counterpart, the male or active generative attribute, was the pine cone. In Assyria, the pine cone was a token of reproduction. In Babylon, it was carried by the creator god Marduk. In Egypt, a pine cone staff was a symbol of Osiris. Papyri show the dead bearing pine cones on their heads before they received Osiris' judgment. In ancient Greece, a pine cone tipped staff marked the cult of Dionysus, and in Rome, the cult of Bacchus. Pine cones abounded in the decoration of Catholic churches, as Sarah had seen in Rome and in Masonic halls. For the Masons, they were linked to the notion of enlightenment, associated with the pine cone shaped pineal gland, which Descartes had suggested might be the abode of the spirit of man. The soul, he wrote, has its seat in the little gland which exists in the middle of the brain from whence it radiates forth through all the remainder of the body by means of the animal spirits, nerves and blood. The cone's slow ripening and opening to release the seeds came to stand for the expansion of consciousness. So Sarah's church, which has pine cone symbols everywhere, would not be Gothic or even pure Romanesque. Its simple form would be wreathed by images that conjured up buried connections with ancient religions Greek, Roman, Egyptian, Hindu, Buddhist, the strata of spiritual rather than geological time. Thank you. We have a little chat and then there's Q and A, is that right? <laughs> I was so glad, by the way, in brackets, that uh, when the tortoise walked across the kitchen table, I was horrified that somebody was going to have a, an experiment of tortoise pie with all the pastries. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't so, know. I was so we pleased don't know. it was only the footsteps that it was. <laughs> no, it was Buckland who ate everything, so perhaps they <laughs> ate the tortoise as well. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, uh, if you haven't read the book, it is a fantastic book. And as you were reading there, I was thinking of William Blake, funnily enough, yes. and the way that he synthesised everything. Um, oh. He comes into this book, but he's never mentioned. They keep saying, who's that loony man painting a mural in the hall? Because yeah. um, he, did, he painted uh, Wedgwood's Hall in Staffordshire. And he also, to make a bit of money, poor chap, um, he, he did all the Wedgwood catalogues. Yes. He, he engraved yeah. all the yeah. designs, the sale catalogues for Wedgwood. Yeah. But uh, that kind of synthesis, which would have shocked the Bishop of Carlisle if he'd understood it all, uh, is just the sort of thing that, um, yes. that Blake loved and the idea of the, the Lotus and the Book of Genesis really being the same. I mean, that's what you get. When Erasmus Darwin wrote a great poem about the Portland vase, mm. um, which Blake again illustrated, uh, Blake had all these ideas which we would think were marvellous, they would have thought were loony, um, of drawing in all these very profound mythological ideas yes. about where does, 
where does consciousness come from, where does life and death come from, where does it go, and all those things, which, which clearly she was thinking about, wasn't she? It must have been maddening for you that she didn't leave so... Uh, or she might have left written remains, but they don't exist. Yes, I think a lot of her papers, she destroyed some, and a lot more were lost. They were, as it were, someone said, you know, the papers of a spinster aunt, the house uh, declined, and so on and so forth. But you, you see, it's... It, 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 it's like you, you know, looking at the experiments books, but also looking at the objects. You can read a lot in there, and and I think that the the other thing is that is that as Wedgwood is bringing the past into the present with the Etruscan vases and and also the whole sort of tradition of pottery. So um, uh, Sarah Losh and her <coughs> others, they, they were. Both families were were radicals. I mean, I mean uh, Sarah's uncle was a Unitarian, just like Josiah. Um, so it, it's a sense that you look to the past to explain, as it were, who, who you are, to provide things of beauty, but you also have a tremendous responsibility to the to the present. I mean, a lot of the book is about the struggles of weavers, just as yours uh, yes. is about, as it were, the lives of the potters. Uh, and also, they were able to see which. Uh, most people are able to see nowadays, but you sometimes wouldn't get it, that science is an essentially imaginative yes. exercise. Yes. You can't be a good scientist unless you live in the world of the imagination. Yes. Blake wouldn't have agreed with that, of course, with his, yes. um, <laughs> his scribbling across the essays of Bacon, good yes. advice for Satan's kingdom. But, um, but nevertheless, we can see that a figure like Erasmus Darwin was essentially... Uh, a poet. I mean, yes. the science and the imagination go together, Thank and you, you certainly get that. In I mean, clearly, what she, sorry, I mean, picking up the wrong <laughs> book. What what she created was an imaginative take on the world yeah. that was coming to terms with Lyell's geology, yes, uh, with all the discoveries yeah. which were being made from the fossils, and with all the thoughts which people which come into your mind when you realise the parallels in world mythology. Yes. Um, with the Bible. And it, 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 uh, I haven't seen the church yet, but I'll be one of those many people. Thanks a lot, Jenny, who'd live, who've <laughs> ruined this village and this church. <laughs> There's be swarms of us going off in our co coach loads, but, yeah. never, but never mind. Uh, I shall be one of them, uh, wrecking the place. Yes. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and what and is nice is, that too, that we've, 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 we've written about uh, geniuses, a woman and a man, um, but who uh, also have a, a lovely sort of tough sense of getting things made and yes. done. So it's not just ideas. They're both fantastically practical. They have a great sense of humour. Um, and Sarah Losh, like any builder, any architect, but also working with her masons, is just as concerned about the drainage, how this wretched, you know, damp area is going to be drained. Um, and uh, and as village the politics. I particularly yes, liked in your story that she... That she she didn't tell the 12 men what she was going to do. <laughs> what she said was, can we divert that path which goes on? Can we have, it, can we have the, the road which goes through the village yeah. slightly diverted, which left the ground free for her? Because otherwise they'd have said, you can't build a church on there last because we've got the road to think yeah. of. And instead, <laughs> she'd already moved the road, and then there was, there was free, yeah. free reign to demolish a beautiful old medieval church. Yeah. <laughs> And they do all help her. They <laughs> do all help her. It and it's a parish that, church it? now. It's you know it's very much the church of the village. So mm. they must have gone off always that you know. But they must have been very again. very proud of it when they saw it. Yeah, yeah for, I think for they the were first. a bit baffled, baffled mm. but proud. Mm. Anyway, we should. should we let you want Q and talk? A? Well, we can have Q, but whether the A comes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'd like to ask a question about uh, girls' education at the time. You said that mm. um, Sarah was extremely well educated, and I wonder where that came from. And I also wondered whether Suki got to do anything other than needlework. Oh, it's a double question. I think. I mean, um, I I I love Suki Wedgwood. I always thought that she was just great, and but that's about. <laughs> Josiah's ideas and the whole group about how they would educate their girls, and then I think a lot of it did that. come, in fact, from uh, in, certainly in the Wedgwood case, but clearly in this case, the, the element of nonconformity and certainly Unitarianism. The Unitarians passionately believed in the equality of the sexes, mm -hmm. and they educated women to the same level. And on the level of what most people in this tent would regard as 
educated. Um, Josiah and the sons were far less well educated than the girls, which was they didn't think it mattered learning languages, for example. Mm. They all just wanted to do chemistry, 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 and he sent them off because they were nonconformists to Edinburgh University, partly so they didn't have to subscribe to the 39 articles, but also so they could read science. Whereas the girls all had French, German, Italian, Latin, Greek um, at their fingertips, as she evidently did. She, yes, she, she did. taught herself yeah. Greek, and she, you yeah. say in the book, she could read Greek without a, a crib, basically. She'd read the tragedies of Sophocles yeah. and things, which is a jolly difficult thing to do. It is. And I think, like, they did also have quite a lot of time, these girls, you know. Well, it was um, like you in the but, rain, wasn't it? Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the... the, um, the the thing was that she wasn't, and, and, and Suki Wedgwood, they really sort of had, they made their own family school, um, and the Darwin children and things like that, too, which had the girls and the boys. Um, these girls were not sort of, for, I mean, the Losh sisters, not formally educated. They didn't go away to school. They were taught by their mother, but they joined in things like the experiments with the father, so they knew about science and so on. Um, and then uh, this Uncle James re really um, became extremely interested, as the Unitarians were, I mean, just in girls' education generally, um, which was a great interest. Darwin wrote a prospectus for his daughters who ran a... a a, a girls' school, um, and when he and the, but the most uh, strangest part was that the education sort of happens by accident. Uh, when Sarah was uh, twelve, um, and James Losh married, and then they took Sarah w with them on their honeymoon. Do you believe it? They took the girls to Bath, um, and in Bath at that time, uh, that Coleridge was there, Southey was there. And so on. They met all these people. Wordsworth nearby, Al Foxton. They went to London. She went to lectures at the Royal uh, Institution, and then it, she asked to have teachers. Um, but by that time, I think she was reading. She was doing languages. She was also doing mathematics, and you know, so her teachers were amazed. But I, I think it is just somebody who. Um, it isn't presented to them. Learning was not presented to them as a chore, a slog. You have to pass these exams. Uh, it was like endless opening doors. And yeah. uh, somehow they created this atmosphere where you could be really excited about finding out. The other good thing, there aren't many good things about being of the female sex before the 19th century, but one good thing is that the universities in Britain were of such poor quality, the old universities, mm -hmm. as you can tell from reading, let's say, Gibbon's autobiography, where he learned absolutely nothing from what he called the monks of Magdalen, steeped in pores and prejudice. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he really did learn nothing if he went to Oxford and Cambridge. So you'd far better off being a clever person living in the provinces and teaching yourself chemistry and Greek and so forth. You probably still are, actually. And it, <laughs> <laughs> That, this dire question the undergraduates are starting to ask, is it worth £9,000 a year? Uh, yeah. It can mean the closure of universities, but that's a different subject. Um. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I must put this in the form of a question, but would you confirm that there are, in fact, two places called Rear in Cumbria? Simon Jenkins' book doesn't have postcodes for those who use sat-navs, Yes, I made a variant of the A.N. Wilson mistake. I went to the wrong one first. Oh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, uh, yes, yes, there are. And I think there's also one in Devon or somewhere like that. So don't go... The sat-nav <laughs> sat would have you roaring through credit and before you do... <laughs> All right, well, I will tell to anybody who wishes to go there, and please do, that this is... For, you go to Carlisle, it's five miles out of Carlisle, you head out sort of towards down the valley towards Penrith and turn off to the right. You can't miss it. <laughs> but, but did you get to the right one in the end? Yes, it was lovely. Oh, good. <laughs> no, he's coming. Yes, and then next over there. Um, this is a question for Andrew. Um, you said, don't get me on the subject of the Wedgwood Museum. And I think it'd be very nice to get you on the subject of the <laughs> Wedgwood Museum. And given its awful recent past, I wonder what you feel is the future for that uh, well, place. I mean, we've both got ideas about this. Uh, I mean, as you probably know, 
one of the inspirations for my book, certainly, but Jenny wrote a wonderful book about the Lunar Men and Wedgwood and all his friends. And so she knows more about the Wedgwood collection yeah, in a way than I do. But um, <laughs> Wedgwood himself, the first thing I'd like to say is that he started the museum. Um, it isn't some modern thing. He always wanted both his experiment books and all the extraordinary range of um, geological experiments he did to be kept. And he wanted his own collection of vases and things to be kept. And it's been built up over the years, and people in the family and people who've got interesting bits of Wedgwood have given to it. So um, that's one thing. Will it all be dispersed? Well, I mean, nothing on this planet remains constant, as we, as we know. So, I mean, it wouldn't be the saddest thing in the world, but it would be pretty sad, I think, if it got dispersed. This uh, collection of people who, for reasons of libel, we can't really describe in a public place, but for both the people who ran the old firm into this appalling sort of capitalist, strange lump called Waterford, Wedgwood, Wexford, Glass, rubbish, um, which went bankrupt. Um, and then these strange people have taken it over. Nobody really knows quite what they've got in mind and who they are. But... Um, the point was that the people in the pension fund, and they're the people who matter really rather than more than, dare I say it, than POTS, um, were in danger of losing their pension money. And a judge, because of Robert Maxwell and everything else, the law has now been backdated, you can't steal from pension funds without somebody coming mm. to save this money. It's got to be saved for them. Um, at the time of the sale, they owed... a about £134 million pounds to the pensioners. But because there was a pension fund in existence, which the judge has now said is an asset of the firm, um, that has risen because the stock market has risen. So they now only need to find about 20 or £30 million. And they could do it. I mean, I, do, I haven't been asked. <laughs> but, I mean, they could do it by simply selling the Stubbs portrait, which I described to you to America, to the excellent Paul Mellon Centre, and keeping the rest intact. And I think something of that kind might happen. It needs a new lot of trustees. Um, and somebody, I know that in this troubled time, somebody's going to say, public money can't be spent, even if it's only 20 million, saving this precious asset um, for the nation, because what happens to all our other worthy things, which, I mean, inevitably, uh, no politician at this stage of the cycle two years before an election is going to say, I think that Wedgwood's 12 attempts at the, we at the Portland vase are more important than a day centre for people with cerebral palsy or something of that kind. They're just not going to come on the radio and say that. Um, and unfortunately, that's the way that it always seems in public life. You have to make a choice. So I'm rather pessimistic about the um, idea that it will be saved. But there are many people, including the excellent Tristram Hunt, mm. who is the local MP, who are optimists and who think that behind the scenes or out in the open there will be some, some salvation, whether it comes under the umbrella of a big, one of the big London museums or the excellent local ceramics museum in Stoke, or whether it can survive on its own. I don't know. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Jenny? Oh, I don't know about the future either. I, I rather ho hope... I think the Stoke Museum um, is... Exciting, and and it would be very, you know, well, one thing. It would have been the in some ways. It's easy to say these things with hindsight. It would have been the obvious place, mm. just to build an extra wing to the already excellent museum in Stoke, mm. and I then you'd have seen him in context with all the other potters. And there were, after all, quite a lot of other people making excellent and interesting things. Yes. And one thing that has happened, which, which is interesting, is that I mean, uh, it's wonderful being here at. Charleston and just looking on the walls and seeing the drawings and everything like that is that you you have a, a collection which you always feel will stay together and I, I know how slowly actually Charleston has been revived into this wonderful place that it is um, and and I think that now um, quite a lot of other trusts who have libraries or who have archives or who have manuscripts um, have actually woken up to the fact that they are vulnerable um, and and are taking care that this not that they will as it were take the money from a pension fund but that but that they will be, remain intact in some way even if it has to be handed on. I mean the awful we won't go on and on about it but the awful thing about the 
the Wedgwood Museum was that because it always was separate from the firm mm. in the first Josiah's mind, when they floated the firm on the stock market in 1963 or whenever it was, I think there were only eight directors of the firm, but um, one of them was my dear old pa, one was Josiah the fifth, and they all they got out the best lawyers they could find to make it completely independent so that this would never happen. But unfortunately, in the, in the years that rolled by, um, five or six members of the museum staff were put on the company pension fund. So that it meant that the 1,700 or so who were really working for the firm were in the same bracket, legally speaking, uh, because it could be described as part of the firm. So that it, it, it was an accident. Nobody meant that to happen. Nobody knew Robert Maxwell was stuffing his pockets with pensioners' money and that the whole law would be changed and backdated. But anyway, let's, let, let, as Jane Austen says, let's quit such odious subjects as soon as we can. <laughs> Uh, it was a question for both of you. Uh, um, Andrew said that Josiah was equally artist and chemist and, and also entrepreneur, as, as were many of the lunar, his lunar society colleagues. Uh, this wonderful moment when it seemed you could be an artist and a scientist and an entrepreneur waned, w why do you think this was? Mm. Um, well, I... I, I'm, I, I was actually trying to think of later examples that would prove that wrong, <laughs> but I can't. But, but certainly, what happened in the um, uh, sort of 1820, 1830s really was that um, science, as we would call it, the the, the experiments um, and the accumulation of knowledge were so great that it began to split into specialisms. Um, and also to use a, a sort of language which was not uh, available to the layman. So you have the group, of, uh, you have the growth of specialist institutions, specialist departments, people not because the the wonderful thing about the uh, 18, late eighteenth century um, and the beginning of the nineteenth century is that somebody keen like Josiah, you know, who left school, could actually read um, uh, read the works of Joseph. Priestley, for example, because Priestley deliberately wrote in language that um, untrained people could uh, understand and have a go themselves. Um, and similarly, Sarah Losh, you could you could read in the Gentleman's Magazine about new archaeological discoveries. So, so there was a there was an access to uh, many more people had access to a lot of knowledge and were encouraged to do things themselves. Once it became specialised, once it became professional, which was very good, as it were, for the growth of the sciences. Um, the, the, that, that wonderful sort of accidental clash well, coming together of an artistic person who reads this and then was excited by it disappeared. Now, I, I actually think that today we're in an age when that's coming back again, when I think a lot of artists looking at um, scientific discoveries or uh, astronomy or uh, physics and, and really beginning to incorporate it into their art again. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, it was, uh, like so many things in history, it was unintended consequence, wasn't it, that they, as they realised it was absurd not to teach people science. So, as Jenny says, the scientific faculties in the older universities and then as the new universities spread uh, all became separate from the arts, and you can't do everything in this life, sadly. So if you were training a chemist or a physicist or an engineer to the highest level, they simply didn't have time to be learning Latin and Greek and Hebrew and Syriac and all the other things which people used to learn in these uh, ancient foundations. And then if you then add modern culture, as it were, and you allow people, yuck, to read English at university or something like that, which is obviously absurd in, by their standards, because you'd all have read these, um, this, un this stuff. You wouldn't have needed a professor to teach you how to read Pride and Prejudice. And... Um, so it is, you get the point, whenever it was, was it the 1950s or the 60s, where this great row burst onto the academic scene between C.P. Snow and F.R. Leavis. Um, Snow deploring the division between the two cultures, and, and Leavis being a sort of archetypical high priest of arts, arts and only arts, saying that C.P. Snow was as undistinguished as it was possible to be for any, <laughs> for any human being to be, um, for even suggesting that you should know anything about science. 
And I think that Jenny's absolutely right. We are now moving back from that yeah, yeah. extraordinary division of cultures. It's done terrible, uh, unintended damage, um, not only, obviously, to the wealth of this country, because the reason that somebody like Josiah Wedgwood made so much money was that he could imagine. Not only did he have the scientific and technical skill to make things, he could imagine what it was like to be a person who'd want to go into a shop. I mean, he invented shopping, apart from anything else. Um, whereas, if you think of the sort of scientific boffins who haven't read a book and haven't met anybody, on the one hand, doing brilliant things and knowing how to bomb the Ruhr Valley or something, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to think in the way that the lunar men thought, mm. practically and emotionally. And I think that all that, I remember when Mrs. Thatcher became uh, Prime Minister, I was uh, a kind of very, very fledgling uh, teacher in a university, and my colleague, who was a geography uh, don, a very bluff woman indeed, um, not politically minded, but she said, I would never vote for her. And I said, why not? And he, she said, I would never vote for somebody who read chemistry. Um, <laughs> bec because you mark my words, she has no emotional intelligence. It turned out, whatever your politics, uh, read the biographies, it's absolutely true. Oh. And, um, and I'm afraid to say that, you know, if only she'd read uh, a mixture. <laughs> of no, Greek, of Greek tragedies <laughs> and chemistry, we would have been a happier country. <laughs> well, that happy thought, um, um, as what might have been, um, I think it's time to draw uh, this session, uh, session to a close, All, also on the thought that maybe we're entering a new era where the arts and sciences um, can uh, coexist um, again. Um, at the very beginning, Andrew, you, you explained to us how, uh, um, you told us the anecdote of um, even in your father's day, they, uh, uh, the potters at Wedgwood would hold up a new creation and ask, you know, did it pass the test? Would it have satisfied Josiah Wedgwood? Well, you've certainly both passed the test uh, um, uh, this afternoon. Afternoon. It's been an absolutely wonderful uh, session and a brilliant uh, combination. Um, so thank you both very much.